Wentz uh, mentioned, my name is Jake Williams. Uh, let's see, so I'm the founder and president of Rendition InfoSec. I did used to be an NSA hacker. We didn't used to talk about that a lot, but then some uh, Russians did. And uh, that whole little shadow brokers event and meh. And uh, as Lyons mentioned, I did actually just fly from Black Hat. Uh, we did the uh, four day training out there. Uh, and uh, then turned around and hopped on a plane and came here and uh, fly back out there to speak at noon there tomorrow. So it'll be awesome. Uh, so not busy at all, right? Um, that said, all right, for an agenda side, I want to talk about phishing pretexts that are working consistently. Um, as Lance mentioned, we do a lot of incident response. Uh, and uh, one of the big things that we deal with in this incident response is ah, phishing pretexts, right? So what, what's getting the attackers in? I want to talk about exploiting third party trust relationships, because this is another big place where, well, Unfortunately, a lot of people get in. And then I want to actually introduce you to something that I find a lot of security awareness people don't know about and you should be educating your users about, and that's transitioning from web-based email access to actually inside the network access, right? Just from compromising web-based email, you get code execution inside the environment. Now, I said a lot of security awareness people don't know about this. I'm finding out a lot of pen testers and incident response people don't know about it, because we'll suggest and say, Did, do you think they came in through Outlook rules? And they're like, they got code execution for Outlook rules? And the answer is yes, they did. And I want to walk you through how that happens as well. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about uh, exploiting data and delivering exploit documents, for that matter, through cloud synchronization services and, and how that's really uh, been a game changer over the last couple of years for attackers. So talk about uh, phishing pretext here. If you don't educate your users, they're going to fall for these consistently. And I got seven of these that I'd like to start with. I'll tell you the number one that we see that is a 100% success rate. 100% success rate that someone's gonna open this, open this document, click on it, enable macros, whatever they need to do to see it. It's company downsizing. Now, the good news is that, the good news is that this gets caught pretty quickly, but I'm gonna tell you here that uh, the attacker knows they're gonna get reported. You have to know this, right? And if you see this pretext used, you should anticipate that uh, attackers are doing smash and grab, right? They need something right meow, right? Uh, they wanna focus education, you wanna focus education and testing uh, on this pretext users that are likely to have time sensitive data. This is not something that an attacker does for the long haul. Smash and grab, get in, get data, get out. We've seen it in a couple of merger and acquisition times. We'll talk about M&A in a few minutes here, right? Because that's another big one, right? But they, they use this uh, pretty consistently, again, when there's a desire to get something right now, they don't care about long-term access. Again, this is the kind of thing that is gonna get reported, you're gonna get caught, right? I, they're gonna get caught. But again, in many cases, if they get the data, it doesn't really matter whether or not they get caught. Uh, again, a short-term access, better than no access, definitely. Talk about number two here, M&A. We do a lot of merger and acquisition due diligence, and uh, wow, right? Uh, by the way, before uh, Lance mentioned uh, you couldn't attribute anything, feel free to attribute anything I say here back to me. I, I don't care one way or the other. I live a pretty public life at this point, so we're, we're good there. Um, but in any case, uh, if you've ever been involved in M&A, you know that uh, users Users often, uh, employees often don't know what their, their long-term status is gonna be. They don't know if, if the uh, you know, vacation policy's changing, how are benefits changing. There's a lot of unknown information there. And anybody who's worked in the field for any period of time, right, we know the psychology of how people automatically wanna fill an information void, right? Uh, again, uh, spies use this, certainly. Uh, we, we know that, that's one of the things that, uh, that folks use for, for recruiting, right, is, is giving out a little bit of information and then letting people come back for that basically to get the, get the good stuff, right? Get the good stuff in there. And, and of course, during M&A, we create this opportunity, right? So we wanna make sure that users know the authorized channels for information. That's a big one right up front, and a lot of folks don't communicate this. When we go in and start a merger and acquisition due diligence, one of our first things that we communicate is you have to educate your users on where the information's gonna come from. There's only one channel where you're gonna get information from, and that's it, right? What, are, what is that channel? What are those channels, I guess, if you wanna have multiple? probably a bad idea, but, and then educate users that attackers are going to attempt to trick them, right? So this isn't one of those like, hey, this is gonna be the only authorized channel, but you'll probably hear some rumors. No, no, tell them straight out. Attackers are gonna come for you. They're gonna use this pretext. M&As become public very quickly, right? And, and we know that uh, after that, particularly after the due diligence period is over, once they've determined that they are actually going to be acquired, or at least there's public talks about that, attackers jump all over this. And this is actually a really, really important piece here too, because we see a lot of merger and acquisition compromises that occur, right? They're not, they're not just taking this as an opportunity to go fish, right? Typically, there's a large company buying a small company, and Big Co has pretty good security, and that's probably who they're after. And Small Co sometimes is a higher acquisition, right? You're probably familiar with that term, higher acquisition, where they're going after the talent at the firm, 
right? And so you have a case where you've got maybe 20-ish, eh, 25-ish, uh, 50-ish, or even a couple thousand people, whatever the case is, the security is generally worse at Smallco. And we've seen attackers come into Smallco and basically wait for those networks to be joined and ride that upriver, right? So, so they're pretty, uh, pretty adept at this, right? So you should tell your employees this is absolutely something that they should be expecting. We see this consistently. Ah, the overdue invoice, right? Ah, creates a sense of urgency, right? So, so we know that beyond just going after, uh, just going after folks for uh, basically for uh, you know information, uh, basic information uh, discrepancy there. Uh, this one's such a good, uh, such a good trick because with these sense of urgency, sometimes folks don't want to do that out of band validation. We want to teach our users to always perform out of band validation, always. And by out of band, we mean not in email. We just wrapped up an incident response with a, a large, uh, <coughs> very large uh, investment firm, and uh, wow, wow, it was, a, it was an outstanding uh, incident response there, but these folks actually move money around via email, or authorization to move money around, and not a little bit of money. Um, we saw one email that we were like, oh, this has to be, has to be the attacker, right? And they sent the email that said, hey, we need you to cover a short, right? $830 million, right? Make sure that you cover that until, so we can open back up on Monday in this other area over here. And I'm like, that's gotta be the attacker. I don't know, that, that one's normal. Okay, let's talk about out of band validation because the, the, basically the reply was, got it, it's covered. I'm like, time out, you guys are moving that kind of money around be over to invoice, right? This is over to invoice to the extreme, right? Look, uh, the other piece here is we're seeing a lot of folks, uh, at least for the short term financial gain, they're going in and they're asking the attack, or basically the attacker is asking you to update payment information, right? So they're saying, hey, you know, here's the new bank routing information, the new ACH, right? So that you can do the transfer. Um, and uh, <clears throat> they'll oftentimes say, hey, we got locked out of our account. We actually saw one recently respond to one, uh, responded to one where they said, hey, we've been hacked. I love this, right? We've been hacked and that's why we don't have access to our email. They took over our bank account and the people bought it hook, line, and sinker, right? Uh, they actually did do a phone call follow-up, right? Unfortunately, they used the phone number that was in the email, right? Um, and so this is one of these things we talk about for out of band. And I know it's funny to laugh about here, right? But it's funny, right? But it is kind of, you know, you're like, oh, major fail, right? But we're talking about $2 million that got taken away from a, uh, taken away from a foundation basically that pays for organ transplants for needy kids, right? So this is not a, uh, this is not an insignificant kind of thing. Two million bucks is a lot of their budget, right? Anyway, focus education on accounts payable, executives, anybody with direct purchasing authority. This works every time, every time, message clipped. If you have not trained your users on this, they will click on this link 10 times out of 10, particularly if you do mobile synchronization, message clipped, right? The attacker sends part of a message, and again, I'm trying to entice you to start, uh, we use this, again, we, I'll tell you, by the way, we do a lot of red team, we do a lot of blue team and in incident response, 90% of the pretexts that we use, we've stolen from attackers. We've looked at what worked to get them into other organizations, and we're like, that'll work for us too, right? And so <clears throat> we saw this from an attacker originally, we're like, yep, that's smart. And sure enough, click that link and off to the races, right? Educate your users on this technique, because if they haven't seen it before, they're gonna click on it consistently. We did a, a test last year where we had a something like 90 some odd percent success rate with this. And by the way, I suspect the people that weren't successful just didn't open the email, right? 90% is a pretty high, uh, pretty high bar there. And uh, a few weeks later, they got hit with exactly this. It was awesome, right? So after the test, they got hit with this and they didn't click it. And it's one of those where the light opened up and you're like, hallelujah, thank you, thank you, thank you, right? But again, if you haven't been trained on this, this is something that, I'll be honest, if I hadn't seen this before, I'd probably click on it. Right? I'm used to seeing kind of the short messages, right? Like the, the click here for more, right? We're trained to do this, we're conditioned to do this. And again, the attacker is merely taking advantage of that. Ooh, this one's so brutal, so brutal. Now typically this is spear phishing, right? And you've won an award. And uh, again, it's, it's really focusing on pride here, right? If, you ever, uh, if you're ever interested in some of the human psychology stuff, I highly recommend some of the, you know, some of the books written by former CIA agents where they talk about how they actually capitalize on, uh, well, agents, right? Basically recruiting assets and, and whatnot. And, and one of the things they talk about consistently is, is, is playing on ego and pride, right? And here, basically you're saying, hey, you've won an award and we need to vet you for the award. We hooked a comptroller uh, last year. Basically, we went on his Facebook page and we found out that he is majorly into t-ball, right? He's a t-ball coach, he's a great guy. I mean, seriously, volunteers a ton of his time but he's a comptroller for a Fortune 500 organization. Woot, right? But he's got 
posts all over Facebook, nothing about his company. We couldn't find any. Guy practices great offsec when it relates to that. And then he won, he won coach of the year from an organization that did not exist until we created it. We created the organization, we stood up the website, right? I mean, how often do you, I'll tell you, every day, nearly every day, at least once a week, I get an email from some organization I've never heard of before, right? Who's like, oh, we wanna recognize your, your company for a, what? Of course they want a reprint fee with it, right? But whatever, I mean, you know the deal there. It's all the whole award for profit kind of thing. We don't do that, obviously. We just say, hey, you won the Coach of the Year award, you've been nominated for this, right? But before we can finalize this, we need to vet, right? We need to vet to make sure that you know, you're a good guy, we need to run a criminal background check, a whole, people will fill out amazing amounts of information. We have more than enough to steal this guy's identity, let alone the fact that we had a shell on his machine, we enable macros, but, because um, a lot of the information doesn't display correctly in the spreadsheet that you need to fill out, right, unless you enable macros, and there's a little button that says so up at the top. Anyway, um, so, <clears throat> we've seen attackers use this though, right? This isn't something that we were like, one day we're like, huh, let's tell them they won an award. No, we saw it be successful, and, We've seen it repeatedly. Now again, this is gonna be a spear phishing kind of thing. You're not gonna see this laid out consistently to hundreds of users, right? The message clip thing, we'll, we'll send it to hundreds at a time, and, and as do attackers, right? Uh, but uh, the takeaway here is, uh, you know, I'll tell you, this is a hard one to, a hard one to really train. You really need to do a demonstration, right? This one's a, a demonstrated, I mean, you can say, by all means, hey, be very, very wary of awards that you might have won, right? Uh, but really doing a demonstration of this drives the point home. This one is absolutely brutal, and the Russians have been using this for more than a decade. And it's basically, you're selected to keynote, you're selected, as a matter of fact, when Lance uh, asked me if I wanted to keynote this event, <laughs> I first had to check and verify that it was a real event, right? And then uh, once I realized it was a real event, we were set. But uh, this is a variation of the award technique. It's, it's really capitalized on the victim's pride. And, and the Russians, again, I mentioned, have been using this for well over 10 years. And in fact, they, they've targeted some very, very high-level NATO commanders and and uh, basically a ministry of defense leaders in different NATO countries, and, and in many cases, they're actually asking them to attend conferences that don't exist. Now, they have good backstops here, where they go create some, you know, uh, Association of Baltic States military uh, or naval planning conference or whatever, and they'll throw a website up, right, because uh, it costs a whopping uh, nothing uh, to buy a domain name and throw a website up, right, and then people look and they're like, woohoo! You know what's even cooler on these, by the way, with the awards? We always list past winners of the awards, right? Uh, and they do too, right? So they list conference agendas from years past. So it doesn't look like a first year conference even. It looks like they've got a history. It builds credibility, right? Never mind that you can't find anything about it anywhere else but their website, right? Nah. Still, they're being invited to keynote, right? So I'll mention here that, uh, you know, if you're educating your users, typically these are going to be more, again, this is going to be more of a spear phishing thing. And typically when they do this, they ask to vet you as well, right? They're like, hey, you've been nominated to come speak, but we really want to talk to you first. And, kind of find some information out about like what would you have to contribute and the, the amount of data that you can pull out of this is absolutely amazing. I mean, I guess it's not gonna shock anyone in this room once you start engaging with somebody and building that trust, right? And again, this is such a great piece here because we're all familiar with the principle of reciprocity, right? Principle of reciprocity, you give somebody something, we are hardwired to wanna give it back. In fact, or give something back. They've actually done anthropological studies on this where, uh, you know, some uh, tribes, you know, that have been separated from you know, the rest of humanity, there's a tribe over in India that they've studied a little bit, and a few in Sri Lanka that are, you know, kind of overcome now, but uh, in any case, they've actually studied, and, and we can find out that this is 100% hard-coded into our DNA. Uh, they've looked at it in chimps even, right? And chimps do the same thing. Give them something, again, the chimp wants to give you something back, and here, we're giving them something, right? We're saying, hey, I want to give you this thing, I want to give you this honor of presenting at this, and very often an honorarium, no less, right? That's another way to hook them hard, right? is say, oh yeah, and you get an honorarium too, and it's gonna be a great thing, and uh, again, uh, we gotta look at the folks that are most likely to uh, be offered this, right? Uh, we wanna make sure that they understand that these aren't always benign, right? And cursory web searches don't, cursory web searches don't legitimize the invitation, right? Uh, so that's a big deal for us here. This is one that, uh, one that we've used pretty consistently. I prefer the award thing personally, because it's, it's less work to backstop, but again, this is being used consistently. We saw a bank executive fall for this two years ago. All right, so worked an instant response there. Bank executive fell for it. I think they lost around, uh, I think it was four and a half or something, four and a half mil. Uh, the numbers roll together after, you know, over the years here. I forget who lost what, but in any case, uh, pr pretty significant here. This one's awesome because uh, this bird of a feather or a club or a whatever, basically the attacker sends an invitation to join an organization sponsor club or group or, or whatever. Um, and uh, a <clears throat> very common one here is, uh, you know, yoga, 
or musicians or a jogging group or a whatever, and they'll send it out. And, and the cool thing is, like, if you go and ask about it, it's like, okay, well, who's organizing this? And it's, nobody would necessarily know because it's kind of unofficial type thing. And this is one of these that we want to train our folks on because what we'll do here effectively is we'll use a spreadsheet and we'll have folks sign up with an online spreadsheet. And what we're trying to do there, of course, is capture credentials because as they go to the spreadsheet, they'll either be provided with a login prompt uh, or depending on your organization's security policies, in some cases, we've already captured portions of the credential by the time you tried to access the, uh, the spreadsheet. Right? So in which case, we won't provide you with a prompt because I don't need that at that point. Uh, but in any case, uh, this works very, very reliably. Uh, a lot of times folks are used to getting like these Google Sheets and, and whatnot. Uh, the big takeaway on this, really this requires some organizational back end, right? Again, this is something that works consistently. Uh, we did this uh, on a pen test last year and uh, I, I actually felt really bad about it because people expressed so much interest in joining our, our jogging club, right? Um, it was the Couch to 5K club. They expressed so much interest in it that we actually had to go, but seriously, we got 70 people to sign up, right? 70 people signed up for a Couch to 5K club. We actually went back to the org and we're like, look, two things, one, security awareness, and two, you should probably do this, right? Because there's a lot of interest here in doing this, right? We should abs, right? And by the way, if you don't, the next time uh, somebody comes in with a Couch to 5K club, game on, right? So anyway, again, you know, basically share that uh, anything that's org sponsored or considered to be along with the org, basically there aren't gonna be these unofficial clubs, right? We'll have an official, uh, official spot for this. And know that we're gonna communicate this in a, a very specific way. We're not gonna use Google Sheets or cloud documents. And then you have to first say it and then you actually have to do it, right? That, that's the hard part, right? Saying it's easy, doing it uh, tends to be a little bit more difficult. So I wanna talk about exploiting third party trust relationships because we are trusting by, by nature, right? Uh, so this is either great or bad depending on who you talk to. We, we wanna trust, right? But as you kind of see in that photo, they're not, not always uh, the best piece here, right? Uh, I'll mention here that largely due to successful security awareness programs from, from folks like you, um, we are having to get craftier and craftier with our pretext. We're having to backstop those with a little bit better cover uh, as our attackers, right? Uh, good attackers. Exploiting vendor and contractor trust relationships, though, is becoming a great way uh, to compromise networks. Now, I'll mention you won't see a lot of red teamers doing this, right? A lot of your penetration tests don't cover this because of brand recognition issues or brand reputation issues. I can't simply come in and say, I'm Jake from State Farm, because I don't really work at State Farm, right? I can't, by the way, I was, I, I was typing something uh, or somebody introduced me in a group earlier this week, a telegram group, and I said, they said, who's that other number? And I said, oh, I'm Jake. And I kid you not, like the autocomplete said from State Farm. And I'm like, <laughs> this can't be a thing. That was like, what, 15 years ago or something those commercials were on? How is that autocompleting? I have never in my life typed the words, I'm Jake from State Farm. But in any case, I can't just say that, right? I can't just say I'm from State Farm because I'm not. It creates a brand issue. The attacker doesn't have that issue. Right? And so if you're not uh, doing some security awareness around this, uh, just bear in mind, this is something that's probably not getting assessed in your, assessed in your red team events. Right? It's probably not getting assessed in your Fish Me or Wombat or whoever it is that you're using because, again, they, they can't mess with the brands. They can't say, they can say I'm from your insurance company, but they can't say Blue Cross Blue Shield. Right? They can't drive that home. And so, you know, again, make sure that you drive that home in those, uh, in those security awareness talks. One of our favorite ones, favorite, horrible, take your pick, uh, basically, Company X, um, obviously not giving away company names here, but they operate a chain of surgical centers. They also do biopsies and laboratories, and they have highly specialized equipment. And this equipment is so specialized that IT can't maintain it. And after one of our monthly The Sky is Falling security events, right, we have at least one of those a month now, whether it's Blue Keep or Spectre or Meltdown or WannaCry or Insert whatever here, right? They said, oh, hey, you know, we're handling all this overflow work and we know we're not your normal vendor, right? But there's so much of it going on because of, and they grabbed the security event of the month, and it was plausible. I mean, it totally made sense, kinda, right? And uh, the company point of contact opened up a log me in remote control binary. It was all over from there, right? Now, I have to tell you here before you're like, why'd they open up a log me in remote control binary? Because that's actually how the real contractor does maintenance on those systems. And so the attacker had done enough work to know up front, who the normal contractor was. They put that in their pretext and said, hey, right, I'm working with the normal contractor. We are uh, basically handling all their overflow work for this. And they used exactly the same brand, exactly the same type of control software. And so there was nothing to, basically there was, as far as the uh, IT person was concerned, they're like, oh yeah, that, that sounds plausible. Yeah, and that, that's what we usually do. And so they did it, right? Um, and they lost uh, a lot of healthcare records as a result. That was a, a very, very sad breach. 
Um, another big one here is infrastructure shakeups. I love this, right? Anytime we're changing on infrastructure, moving to cloud email, or changing cloud providers, right? Um, this is always an opportunity for attackers to capitalize on because you're getting a lot of emails, particularly when you use overflow contractors to help with that work, surge work. A lot of times we're getting emails from people that, that we don't normally get emails from. Sometimes they're from outside the organization. I highly recommend that you never let your contractors email from outside the organization. Give them email accounts. Give them internal email accounts, right? Because when you don't, we're setting our users up for failure. We just are. And some people are like, well, particular Office 365, right, or, or Google Apps for Business, there's a cost to that, right? You actually have to pay for each email that you create, and they're like, ah, we could save a few hundred dollars here. And I'm like, don't save a few hundred, you're not first, you're not saving it, right? Let's be clear about this. The cost of a breach is, is very clearly higher than very clearly higher than that. And attackers can tell you're moving just by performing OSINT. You have to do work up front to, uh, to get these domains set up and change your mail, exchange your records and all that. They can actually look at DNS. They can see that you're starting to make this migration. So I want to talk about reviewing your mailbox rules because mailbox rules are the number one indicator of compromise for business email compromise. Number one IOC for BEC. Audit your, audit your inbox rules because attackers regularly are changing these. If you haven't seen this yet, Trust me, you will, right? Or if you haven't seen it yet, maybe it's because you're not looking, right? That's a possibility too. It may have already happened, right? But uh, attackers will duplicate copies of all emails received and they'll send them over to the attacker. And this is great because it's a gift that keeps right on giving even after passwords are changed, right? So basically, they'll continue to synchronize email, uh, do the same with sent email, right? So basically, everything they send out, your uh, victim sends out, that's a big one. We saw this, uh, we've seen this actually now in several cases where the attackers are deleting email from anybody who's questioning legitimacy of the attacker's email. Or it's like, did you really want to wire money over there? Right? You're getting kind of secondary, and they'll just delete them. They've got it set up where all of a sudden, in fact, we detected a breach, well, not we, but one of our victims detected a breach when <clears throat> they basically had a chance meeting in the hall between two people, and uh, one of them said, hey, I've been emailing you for days and you haven't responded, what the heck? And the other person said, you, you haven't emailed me. And she said, no, no, I have, and pulls up her sent mail, right, off her, on her phone, right, pulls up sent mail on her phone, and they're like, oh, snap, we have a problem, right? We went in, and sure enough, right, they had, she had sent an original email over saying, seriously, you want me to move, right? And by this point, they had completed four transfers, right? The attacker completed four transfers, and they were only able to reverse one of them, right? So very, very sad day here, but again, this is a, a inbox rule modification, right? So if we start looking for any of those modifications, you could turn this logging on from an incident response standpoint, but I'll tell you, one of my problems here is these rules are hard to audit. They're here for a reason. Users use them all the time, and I, I can't tell as an incident responder, as a security staff, IT security staff, what's legit and what's not. Only the user can, honestly, right? Um, now look, if, if I see something that says forward all email that, with the word ACH to uh, you know, bigbadattacker at gmail.com, got it, that's bad, right? But pretty much anything short of that, it's very difficult for me to say, that rule doesn't serve a legitimate business purpose, because I've seen a lot of them where I'm like, that's definitely bad, and somebody comes back, I'm like, that's definitely not, here's the business case for it. I'm, I'm done, right? I can't, there's no way for me as a security person to be able to do this. So the big takeaway here is educate users that this is gonna happen to them, right? Eventually it's gonna happen to them, or at least to someone in the org, and train them on how to audit their own rules. And as a matter of fact, if you set up like a, a weekly, monthly, a whatever, whatever the right cadence is, right? Maybe you have a rule audit day, something along those lines. We have to educate users on doing this because, again, it's not something security can really audit effectively on the back end. Ooh, the sessions were disabled. I love this one, right? So we're working instant response, a big instant response here earlier this year with Office 365, and there were a lot of issues with trying to figure out how the attacker was maintaining access because they would find an account, they'd kill the account, and they'd say, okay, we're disabling all logins and validating all the sessions. And everybody assumed that was happening immediately, and, and we knew that wasn't the case, we just didn't know how long immediately meant, right? So when you say we're logging all the users out, uh, on-prem, that works just immediately. And unfortunately, in the cloud, it doesn't work immediately. And uh, we found, uh, found out that in some cases, they can live on for more than an hour, right? So those sessions can live on for more than an hour, during which time, the attackers are continuing to use that email box, right? Now, this is pretty critical, right? Because if we turn around and we say, hey, we're locking the accounts out, and now we're gonna move, uh, basically, uh, lock the accounts out and validate sessions, I assume it would happen immediately, it does not. So what can we do about it? Look, bottom line, we have to just tell our users that locking the attacker out isn't gonna work here, right? The, at least if their account's compromised, there's gonna be some period of time that we cannot control, we cannot control, that their account's still going to be accessible to the attackers. From a security awareness standpoint, 
We should let them know to notify at least key personnel that might email them or might receive email from them out of band, not using the email, obviously. Notify them that at least for the next, and I would, for safety reasons, at least double my, my hour plus here, right? For the next few hours, any email you receive from me should be considered suspect, right? Again, if we don't know this, right, in the middle of one of these incidents, again, it's very, very easy just to assume that everything is set. Right? Uh, code execution through Outlook Web Access. Love this, absolutely love this, right? Now, I'll mention here, once an attacker has access to Outlook Web Access, OWA, or Office 365, they can turn this into code execution. Orgs allow for synchronization, a lot of organizations allow for the synchronization of mail via IMAP without multi-factor authentication, even when you set up MFA for OWA. Now, once we have out, access to Outlook, we can import new email rules, right? So all those email rules that the attackers are using, we can actually set these up to go run commands on their local machine once the user logs back in, right? So picture now, I'm on their webmail, and the next time they open up Outlook without any interaction from them inside the environment, when they open up Outlook, commands automatically execute and we get shell on their machine. This is obviously a worst case scenario. Right? Well, a bad case scenario, let's, let's not talk about worst case yet. Alas, attacker uh, walk through here, basically the attacker connects up to Outlook uh, and <clears throat> basically creates a rule to run a command uh, basically anytime they see something with a specific subject line. And of course, the attacker can send that subject line in. Outlook won't allow the rule to be input if the command runs from a remote share. For instance, like WebDAV or uh, SharePoint in the cloud or whatever. Unfortunately, Outlook only performs that check during the insertion of the rule, not the execution. This is another great, interesting security boundary kind of spot because if I can use an editor, right, a binary editor, and go in and change those rules, it turns out then I can create custom rules that give me the keys to the kingdom, right, that will run commands from remote shares. So for a security awareness takeaway, we want to educate users that an email compromise is not just an email compromise, right? That if their account has been taken over, we want to know at least that they've, we've taken a look at their machine. Again, this is really where, outside of security awareness, we want to make sure that our, well, I guess it is awareness, that we aware, make our incident responders and threat hunters aware that this is a possibility. Again, I'm running into folks, I mentioned it just came from Black Hat. I chatted up several folks who didn't know this was a thing. They said, hey, what are you covering here? I'm like, oh, you know the OWA trick. And they're like, no. I'm like, okay, well, if hackers don't know this, I'm betting that a lot of other people don't either. We need to make sure that folks, particularly on our threat hunting side, understand that this is a thing, as well as our users. And then finally, exfiltrating data via cloud sharing. I hate file synchronization. I mean, I love it, and I hate it at the same time. It's great for convenience. All my files are on every machine that I'm on, and it's just awesome, and I don't have to worry about backup, and attackers know this too, because cloud, cloud synchronization is just a cancer. It's a security cancer. Um, attackers use these data synchronization tools to bypass DLP and other network security controls. They know that they can send a document in via Dropbox, via, uh, goodness, via Google Drive, via whatever it is that you're using, OneDrive, SharePoint, whatever, and DLP and most of your security suites cannot inspect the traffic. Now, your endpoint protection can, right, but let's be fair, that was the last line of defense, right? We don't, we've been talking about defense in depth now for 15 years, right? We, 15, 20, 25 years, whatever, right? If we're talking about literally like the first time we get to inspect this thing is the last possible chance before breach, that's a problem, right? Now, I'm not here to tell you don't use cloud synchronization. I will tell you that, uh, that it has become a big, big deal for us and it's, it's an ending up uh, contributing to a lot of our compromises. I'll mention that OneDrive uh, is great because it's on every Windows 10 machine. Uh, we see it a lot in BYOD devices, even if it's not used by corporate. Um, OneDrive typically isn't the choice of attackers because it works best with the whitelisting controls, but, but I'll tell you, we see it used when there's good whitelisting application controls because of, basically they say, hey, we won't allow Dropbox, right, because it's not on the explicit whitelist, then we see attackers pivoting over to OneDrive. Otherwise, it's typically Dropbox. Skype, oh my gosh, Skype, right, if this is part of your internal communications, be afraid, be very afraid. Look, if you're going to use Skype, I'll tell you this, 100%. Use Skype for business, or what is it now, Link? No, Microsoft Teams for business now. It changes every year, right? It was Link, then it was Skype for business, now it's Microsoft Teams, and the, take your pick, it's the same app, right? Bottom line, use an internal team, do not allow requests from outside. Lots of users hate this, right? Because if they want to Skype with somebody else, and it's gonna need two instances running now, one for corporate, one for not, but I'm telling you, those things coming, those links coming in from outside, you don't actually get a chance to inspect those, and we can send files in over Skype. We regularly do this, and we've seen a number of breaches where this has been the entry method as well. So I'll mention here a, a case study attacker compromised user credentials through social engineering, and they were able to access a VDI, or a VDI remotely, and they did have multi-factor authentication, because the first thing that people are like, ah, oh, MFA would stop this. No, no it doesn't, right? Um, we're a duo partner, a rendition, 
I love Duo 100%, I use it, right? And uh, oftentimes I, I find myself getting a notification and I'm like, wait, what's that for again? And some users feel that way too, so they just tap the notification, right? And that's what happened here, right? Now, these folks were actually getting, we did a post-mortem on this, and we found out that on average, by looking at the logs, this user had gotten 70 Duo notifications per workday. 70, right? Now, look, that's great for security, but it's also horrible for security, because he was getting 70 Duo notifications a day, and he got conditioned to go click, 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 and one popped up, he went click, and the attacker had access to VDI. And the virtual desktop environment only allowed applications digitally signed by a trusted certificate. They had good endpoint protection security software installed. The attackers brought in Yandex Disk. Yandex Disk is kind of like Google Drive, but Russian. Um, and uh, basically then they exfiltrated hundreds of gigabytes of data, 300 gigs before it was all done, right? Which is just massive, right? Uh, from public file share, right? This wasn't uh, considered to be super sensitive information until they went and audited it, right? Uh, by the way, your public file shares, absolute treasure trove for your attackers, right? There's an amazing amount of stuff on there, typically because IT takes a long time to create security groups or whatever the case is. I could spend a whole day talking about root cause for that as well, but anyway. All right, thank you so much, Jake. That was awesome. Thank you, Lance.